Welcome to the Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Well, I think you've uh, introduced the kind of the first social challenge, which is just the the freedom of choice that a student has in learning how to make good decisions, be discerning, developing, uh, I guess, the virtue of discernment and some element of, uh, of perseverance in terms of their commitment to to walking with God and reflecting the virtues that Scripture talks about. Um, uh, what else is represents a social challenge, and what are the intellectual challenges on campus? Well, I think a big social challenge is that Everyone seems to drink. I mean, that's like the cool thing to do. Mm -hmm. But of course, they don't drink responsibly. And then uh, there are all these clubs, Mm -hmm. as I mentioned earlier, within the radius. For Asians, Koreans, they have something called K-Town, which is Koreatown. Hmm. And uh, they're not particularly concerned about carding you and saying, well, okay, you know, are you of legal age? They just want you to get the expensive booze uh-huh. <laughs> and help them to uh, bolster their business. And so we've had incidences where students will get plastered, mm-hmm. and then they drive back and they crash, and they'll have a DUI. And uh, it's very unfortunate to see that. But I think alcohol is a huge social issue because everyone does it. It's a big pressure, both within the Asian culture as well just in the college culture. So I think. At UCLA, it's very plentiful, and then all the fraternities and sororities are within walking distance. And of course, you know, you you just have to walk in, and if you're a gal and you're a pretty face, they'll welcome you in. So uh, there's no restrictions. Everything is offered to you. You're very tempted, and if you aren't strong in the temptation, you're, you're going to give in to that. So that's the big social one. Now, uh, I'm going to ask a larger cultural question here because it helps to define the, the alcohol issue, and that is, generally speaking, in the Korean community, when it comes to Christians and drinking, is there, uh, you know, I mean, I'm from Texas and, you know, Southern Baptist, you don't drink. So uh, is there... Is there abstinence generally in the churches that is urged, or is it more uh, drink in moderation? I mean, what is it that a child coming out of a uh, Christian background would have been exposed to in the context of a Korean church? Well, it's pretty strict of abstinence. You cannot, you should not. It's a horrific sin if you do. But that's the problem in the sense that the way it was communicated now when these young kids are out of their you know parents homes there's no restriction there's no mom and dad saying you can't do this Mm -hmm. and so they swing the pendulum the other way Mm -hmm. and they become uh totally intoxicated with this stuff and uh uh, i've seen some pretty bad cases and I, i think it's a response that is just a reaction to how strongly and perhaps how legalistically some of this was proposed. And so I think we're rethinking this. We just had a meeting with our campus leaders this last Saturday, and we were just exhorting them. Uh, you know, if you're of age, be responsible. Mm-hmm. If it's under younger classmen who are under 21, then don't do it so that it stumbles them. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we're able to talk about this in a healthy manner that – that would allow them to be mature and to make wise decisions. But for the most part, Korean churches and parents have said just strongly, don't do it. And there's no explanation why. It's if you do it, you're a sinner. And uh, that hasn't res- that doesn't go well with millennials especially. Yeah. Now, um, some of the other campuses that we've done interviews with, the whole issue of sexuality and the challenge of sexuality on the campus is also a big issue. Is 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 that true in the Korean community, or is the Korean community more restrained in this regard? My personal opinion is that the perception is that it is restrained, but the reality is it is not. Mm-hmm. You know, Asian culture is a strong honor and shame culture, much like the first century. And so that's still ingrained in our culture as Asians. But what happens with that culture is that we go stealth, or we go underground. So it's being done, but it's not flaunted in the same way that uh, uh, maybe a Westerner would like want to take credit or make notches for their, you know, sexual conquerings of people or whatever. So, uh, but when I've counseled students, 
who are Asian in nature, they'll have as many, if not more, of the same problems. But because of shame, they they won't make that known publicly. So so it's a little bit harder to deal with in the sense that it's underground, and so it's less likely to come up directly. Absolutely. Now, um, another issue that we often see on campuses is not so much uh, not so much the personal uh, sexuality choices that a person has, but the environment of sexuality that's on the campus in general, uh, and and the views with regard to sexuality that people are exposed to. I would take it we're in UCLA, we're near Hollywood, that this, this, is, a, this is also an issue that's of significance. Yes. Uh, obviously, within evangelical Christianity, this is a hot topic that we're trying to formulate solid, truthful, gracious, but uh, loving responses to some of the movements that are there. Uh, our students have friends, co-workers, dorm mates, classmates who are of homosexual, lesbian, gay, transgender, bisexual, you name it, and they don't know what to do with this. They have a general idea, but they also have the relational friendships with these people, and they seem like they're nice people, and maybe they've known them since high school or even grade school, and this is a constant question that's being asked. You know, what do we do? And how do we respond? Should we reach out? Should we go where they go to or not? And and so we're, we're asking the Lord for a lot of wisdom. This is where my resources, again, at the seminary would be very helpful to have people who can give thoughtful responses where we're not stereotyped as just, you know, intolerant and hateful, but at the same time we do uphold truth, we want to give grace, and of course we want to share the gospel with these folks. And uh, so... I think that's going to be one of the big challenges that we need to really put attention to to help college students to know how to give thoughtful and careful responses because that is the reality of the secular university. Now, um, I take it to, to these topics sometimes come up in your meetings that uh, as topics that are addressed, and who tends to address those for you all? I mean, do you get pastoral help or do you get help from somewhere else? We try to go for both pastoral and uh, professors. So, of course, uh, your friend and my friend, Scott Ray, is a real good source. He uh, always gives sound biblical advice. He's got a lot of experience, not just textbook ideas, but real practical ideas. So we'll have him or someone come to the campus and give a talk on this. It's pretty much an in-house family talk, helping the students know how to respond. Uh, I believe they've had Veritas forums where they might have introduced this as a topic, but they're careful because that could draw a lot of heat uh, more than light in light of uh, it being a very you know, highlighted issue that the media could get into. It could turn into a three-ring circus. Hmm. Now, I'm very aware that at USC, the um, gay and lesbian uh, student groups are very active, very visible, and actually uh, among the more popular groups on the campus. Um, what's the situation at UCLA? I don't know specifically, but my guess is it would probably be the same. Okay. Um, well, that's some of the social challenges, and and I, you know, I take it that your core response to these is to is to, uh, if I can say it, you know, surround and encourage the student with support. Is that a good summary? Yes, I think so. Um, and uh, okay, well, let's turn to the intellectual challenges now. Does UCLA? Um, offer some intellectual challenges to students on the campus? Yes. Um, one of the surprising things, Daryl, is that whether they're overt or, or you know, under the radar, there are a lot of faculty at UCLA who are actually believers. Hmm. Um, I actually worked in the chemistry department uh, for 16 years. I was a I washed test tubes, that's how I started as a student in the 80s, and I got to work my way up where actually I was in charge of photocopying all the chemistry exams for all the classes, and I would deliver it to professors. And part of why they trusted me with this was I was a, a youth pastor at the time, so they thought that I had some integrity, so I was thankful for that. Hmm. 
Um, but I, I think that what is surprising is that all these Christian profs, when they talk about their faith, they will do so in a very inviting way where it's not um, it's not in your face. Uh, there was a guy named Chip Anderson who he passed away many years ago. He taught a very popular communication class. At the end of the quarter, he would say, I have some other really important things that I would love to share with you about. And if you are interested, stay after class and I would love to share that with you. He was known to give out bookmarks that had crosses on it. Uh, this was a big class, Tara, like 500 students in the hmm. largest lecture hall. And so these kinds of stories I am mindful of and remember them. And then we've had other people, uh, just recently Scott Barchi, uh, some of you might know him. Yes. He retired, and uh, he was doing stuff around. And and uh, there are movements within crew where they've worked with faculty at UCLA. And and I've I've known and identified a number of them. And I think what they do is in their office hours, they do share about the gospel. And I think students somehow know about these professors. So when they face an atheistic professor, which there are plenty of those, they'll then go to a person who's in that same discipline and say, can I ask you what you think about, let's say, you know, molecular biology or evolutionary, you know, mm -hmm. sciences, and they're able to, to respond. So I think that's been an interesting dynamic that we've seen. I don't think all the students are aware of it, but, you know, students talk to each other, and with social media, they, uh, they text or message each other. So I think... Uh, the professors asked them to not put it out on Facebook so that everyone would see it because that could uh, jeopardize some of their you know, tenure and otherwise. But for the most part, I think students are aware of these Christian professors. So uh, that's an interesting dynamic. So there is internal support, at least potentially, if, if a student has uh, sensitive radar in terms of what's going on. Are there, are there challenges intellectually on the campus? I mean, you mentioned at, at UCSD there was the Western Civ course that was a challenge. Um, uh, anything like that going on at UCLA? You know, it's interesting. You would think that the philosophy department, for example, would have been one of the strongest challenges. But for many years, there was a professor here named Dr. Robert Adams. He and his wife were Christians, but they taught the intro philosophy classes. Hmm. So they actually brought philosophy and religion into their general philosophy classes. To my knowledge, Daryl, surprisingly, I have not found too many antagonistic professors I've heard of, of a few. Most of them were in the sciences. Mm -hmm. Most of the ones – UCLA is divided into South Campus, North Campus. So North Campus is more the liberal arts. I haven't heard too many in the liberal arts. And surprisingly, when I go to campus, students don't ask me as many questions as Irvine or San Diego. That's very, very interesting. Well, I think that UCLA may grade out in this interview process as one of the more uh, accepting of – uh, of Christian faith, uh, that actually uh, can be an encouragement to students in the midst of all the other choices that they have. I think another huge thing too, Daryl, is there are so many Christian organizations at UCLA. Mm -hmm. I don't know the latest statistic, but I believe there is as many as 90 Christian groups at UCLA. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. Now, I, I almost hesitate to ask this question, but since we did it for the other colleges, I probably should. Um, I take it that there's church support too for students who are there, so that if there's a, a place for a student, there are plenty of places for students to go uh, and, and get connected to a larger community. Yes. So uh, one church that has a large campus is Grace Community Church, John MacArthur's church. So mm -hmm. they have a Bible study called Grace on Campus. Uh, I was part of the initial group that started in '86 for that Bible study. And uh, when I was there, I was the only Asian in that Bible study. Hmm. Now it's 70% Chinese and Korean. Hmm. It's really just taken off in that way, and that's a trend generally for campus ministry. Yeah, I want to come back to that. Okay. Uh, I think Yongnok Celebration Church, which is a church that I go to, that's been a real support. Uh, LA Open Door Church is another uh, supporting church. Um, uh, Bel Air Press. Uh, West L.A. Baptist Church, uh, 
The funny thing, Daryl, is a lot of people who would go to UCLA, they actually travel pretty far to church. So a lot of churches that are there, we don't have that much interaction with. A lot of the churches are at least half an hour to an hour away. That's where the students go. Oh, now that actually raises a question I was going to raise about all these campuses and didn't ask and probably should. And that is, how much of these campuses are commuter campuses versus students living on campus? I'm, my sense is, is that in California, you're dealing more with commuter students, generally speaking, than you are residential students. The UC schools have a large dorming system and apartment system. Mm -hmm. And so typically, the most UC students, I'd say up to maybe 80%, live on or near campus. Oh, wow. So they don't commute necessarily. Hmm. But at the Cal State level schools, like Cal State LA or Cal State Fullerton, those are the opposite. They are primarily co commuter schools. So that's the little different dynamic. That has led to some problems with campus ministries because when students are on campus, they, they want to be there. Yeah. So they'll stay a little bit longer and come to, to our general meetings. We tried campus ministry at some of these Cal State schools, which are primarily commuter schools. They just are in and out. And so to stay another hour or two, that's an inconvenience for them. So it's been difficult to do campus ministries at the Cal State level. So there are, what I'm also hearing now is there are two kinds of state universities in California? Is that is that correct? Correct. Interesting. Um, and from, a, from just the state's point of view, what is the difference between the two systems? Is there a difference? The UC system, I think they're, they're, what they would say is that's the top 12% of the elite academics graduating out of high school go I to see. the UC systems. It is much more expensive, mm -hmm. but they also have maybe, in most cases, better quality professors and thus education. Uh, Cal States are more affordable, but I don't believe that they are as difficult to get into. They have excellent professors there all across the boards as well. But some would say maybe generally it's not uh, at the same level as some of these schools like UCLA. Okay. Um, so um, well, let's wrap up on UCLA here. Um, it, it sounds like um, in many ways UCLA is not – well, how do I say this? It's not as intellectually challenging a campus in, in being less hostile to Christianity, but in some ways, at the personal level, it's more challenging because of all the choices. Is that a fair way to summarize? I, I would generally say that's true. I, I'm sure there are some antagonistic and hostile academic challenges around. I'm not saying that there aren't. But the predominant challenge seems to be the social challenges and the environment because of what you said, all the choices, all the temptations. So, um, so – how would you say the ministry in UCLA differs, if it does, from uh, UC Irvine or UC San Diego? Well, I, I think that the students have a little bit different attitude in some ways. Uh, from the UC San Diego, UC Irvine perspective, they might say the students are a little more stuck up. Uh-huh. Um, uh, they might be viewed as, uh, you know, in the UC systems, the two coveted schools are Cal Berkeley and UCLA. I see. And so, and I don't think even from a ranking perspective, uh, it's necessarily true that other schools are not as good. But the perception is that there's a first tier, which would be UCLA and Cal, a second tier, which would be like Irvine and, and San Diego, and then there would be a, a third tier which would be like uh, maybe you know Riverside or uh, you know some of these other UCs that are not as well known, and uh, that's the perception that unfortunately plays into the stereotype of Asians who try to get into the top tiers, and they feel sometimes discouraged when they don't get into those, and a lot of it is the parental pressure and the stereotypes and so forth. But I mean, all of them are excellent schools, and they mm -hmm. all have excellent professors and. Obviously, the students are all very bright. I've got to meet many of them. So I, I think it's more of a stereotype than, than an actual thing. 
Now, um, again, this is partially to help churches and parents and that kind of thing. Uh, so when we, you know, when I think of California schools, I certainly think of UCLA and Berkeley, but I also think of USC and Stanford. So, uh, our, and maybe Pepperdine is in that mix as well. Um, uh, are USC, Pepperdine, and Stanford private schools, not state schools? Is that the difference? Correct. They are private schools. I see. So, so part of the uh, part of the rivalry between USC and UCLA has to do with the structure of the school and kind of where it's coming from in, in terms of uh, it, it's co- competing for the LA or the Southern California student. No, there's no rivalry, Daryl. There's no rivalry. I, I look. I know that's not true. I've gotten up and <laughs> spoken in groups uh, in California. Um, well, um, so summarize. You've been been doing this 30 years now. Uh, I'll come back to a question I asked at the start in light of our conversation, and that is, how do you think campuses have changed from the time you started ministering? To now, now we're not thinking so much of the individual campuses as kind of the environment there in Southern California as a whole. Well, I think there are so many more temptations that can hinder students, whether it be accessibility to social media. Uh, many years ago, the internet was not a big issue. Uh, a lot of it has to do with what you can do on the internet. You can do gambling. And I've met students who are ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 in debt when they go online and they do this. Oh, wow. Of course, pornography is rampant. Uh, all these things. And uh, all these distractions with the pressure to study harder, with the sense that if you study harder and graduate with a degree, you'll get a better job. You get a better job, you'll make more money. Now it's uh, kind of a competitive, more competitive because there aren't so many jobs. The economy is fading. All of these things, all of those really hinder people in terms of their faith. And so uh, I think that many years ago it was easier to do campus ministry than now. Now uh, it's, it's tough to get the students to come out. And that's where I think the key is you've got to enlist other students who are committed to get those students because they're more apt to come out because their peers come out than if, let's say, we just have a big hoopla and just throw a bunch of food out there. So I think that peers are really key. Well, and I think the overall flavor of this interview has struck me because, uh, you know, normally when you think of the challenges of the university and the university campus, you think about the challenges of what happens to a student intellectually and the way in which their Christian faith gets challenged at that level. But you're really saying that the larger challenges in many ways are operate at a much more personal and relational level. Fair? Yeah, I would say so, at least for our students. Yeah, that that's that's interesting. And you're the second interview we've done that involves a major school, um, Princeton being the other one, that uh, where, where this – pressure at the personal level is so intense. Um, It's in a different way at Princeton, but it's the same kind of core challenge uh, to the whole person, if you will, in their walk, as opposed to merely being a challenge about how they think about the Christian faith. So Uh, when we go back to like youth groups, what we need to do is we need to help them not only have a robust, solid worldview, but we need to help them mature so that they would have biblical wisdom to make the right choices when they're faced with all these temptations. I think that's what we should major on. That's interesting. Well, that's a great word, and uh, I think it's an interesting place to kind of wrap up our our conversation. Uh, Ben, I really appreciate you taking time with us to do this. Uh, It's it's great to see you. You know, we usually – at least get to touch base when I get out there in the summers. And uh, and so I wish you all the best as you continue to minister to these campuses and as you minister on the Talbot campus. And I thank you for taking the time to talk with us today. All right. Thank you, Daryl. God bless you, brother. And uh, we thank you for joining us on the table as we look at the state of uh, ministries and the nature of, uh, of challenges that students face on college campuses around the United States. for listening to The Table Podcast. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.